Uh, I will leave it to Gary to actually introduce tonight's featured artist. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I'm pleased to welcome painter, critic, and author Gary Fagan, co-founder and artistic director of the Gage Academy of Art in Seattle, as well as the school's still life atelier instructor. He also serves as a lecturer in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UW, where he teaches facial expressions to graduate animation students and works on a research team studying the human perception of stylized facial expressions. He's taught at art schools around the country, including National Academy of Design and Parsons, and in 2001, he published his first book, The Artist's Complete Guide to Facial Expression, which has been translated into many languages. And with that, please join me in welcoming Gary Fagan. Great. Thanks, Weir. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks, Yamira, for joining us tonight. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure uh, collaborating with Town Hall over the years. We and I were talking about this. Uh, uh, this uh, collaboration goes back at least eight years, maybe 10 years, and we both have similar goals in this collaboration, which is really the to build and enhance and bring attention to and celebrate and enjoy the art community of Seattle. So we produce artists, we train artists, and please go onto our website, gageacademy.org, and check out our many offerings, uh, all times of day, one day classes, weekend classes, evening classes, classes for beginners, advanced, intermediate, and uh, artists of, of who sculpt, paint, and draw. Uh, but we also feel like if we're putting artists out into the Seattle art community, we want it to be as thriving an art community as possible. So they have an informed, an interested, and an enthusiastic audience for the work that they do. And so when we do these uh, uh, shows at uh, Town Hall, these talks at Town Hall, we bring attention to stellar members of the local art scene like Humera, who is showing now at Greg Casera Gallery, and has had shows in the area. She had a show at the Bellevue Art Museum a few years ago. Um, and uh, she showed another gallery called Arts Exchange, which I, I first saw her work down in the stadium district. But we want to bring attention to the stellar artists that we have in our community who are out there doing the sort of work that we hope our grad students will do as they progress in their own careers. Now, in the case of Humera, uh, she did not go to art school in Seattle or even close to Seattle. She went to art school in Lahore, Pakistan. And uh, because I've talked to her a few times, I know a little bit more about Lahore. I know it's, I don't know, Humera, you gotta forgive me, sort of the Seattle of Pakistan. <laughs> It's, uh, uh, it's, it's known as sort of the art center of Pakistan and also a, 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 a more liberal atmosphere perhaps in other parts of Pakistan. And she explained to me that the school where she went to art, uh, her art school, which is thought of as the best art school in, in, in Pakistan, had very many women, and I think it's maybe even run by women when you were there, right? Was there a woman director? Yeah, and after she graduated, she studied sculpture and miniature painting. They offered her a teaching position. Uh, but one thing led to another, and, and, and she and her family ended up moving to Seattle in 2008, and she's been, been here ever since. Uh, but she has forged for herself a distinguished and very unique career as a, a, a feminist wood sculptor, working with issues, as you will see, that are, are, are very, um, you know, very relevant to world affairs nowadays, and unfortunately, they continue to be even more relevant with things like the current war in uh, in the Ukraine, uh, because that war and destruction and refugees are one of her big themes, as you will see. But anyway, she manages to express it all in very unusual materials, and she's had a great deal of success and recognition in her career as a result. So, uh, and uh, if you're interested in her technique, which we will talk a little bit about tonight, we're gonna do a virtual studio tour with her in exactly a week at 7 p.m. on the 17th. Um, we won't be there, but, but uh, uh, she's gonna walk us through and we can ask her questions and show, show us her workbench and so forth. So you can check that out on the Gage website for further information about that. So, with that introduction, Yamira, let me turn things over to you and and uh, talk to us about your work. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share my work and my story. Um, I'm actually a storyteller, um, and I believe we are all made up of stories. The stories we tell others, the stories we tell ourselves, and most importantly, the stories we hide. 
and I am most interested in the stories we hide. I went to art school against the wishes of my family. Um, they were not really uh, in favor of me going to an art school. Art schools were considered places where kids get too much freedom and it was considered not good, especially for women. So I remember that was the first time I took a stand for myself and my family was sitting on one side of the table, I on the other. And I said, no matter what, I'm going because I feel this is my calling. And I'm the youngest in my family and I remember uh, later on when they realized that I am going, my brother came and gave me warnings not to wear sleeveless or smoke because that's what girls do there, they get too much freedom. And I, although I don't smoke, but I ended up painting myself holding a cigarette. And just to counter the stereotypical image um, which was related to these things, um, I went to art school and I took sculpture as my major. Uh, a lot of people warned me there were additional layers of challenges for um, not just that it's uh, physically challenging, but also living in a Muslim country, everything that was three-dimensional was con considered going against religion and there was a reaction against it. And also uh, painting object, uh, objects or figures uh, was considered not, actually kind of the people confused it with religion. So I took sculpture and miniature painting both as uh, my major subjects. I was interested in both and in past few years I have been equally passionate about them and so I decided to combine them. This is also one example where I have combined them in an installation. I grew up in a society which was very closed. A lot of issues considered uh, taboo, for example, menstrual cycle, uh, puberty, sex, even relationships, miscarriages, fertility issues. There were a lot of taboos and I always asked question why. Um, and I decided to bring them up in my work as well as molestation and rape, uh, which is also, uh, which was existing in that society as well. Uh, molestation and rape by close family relatives uh, as well as biological brother in this case. So I collaborated with a close friend who shared her story that she was molested throughout her childhood by her own biological mother, brother and her mother knew about it and did not try to save her, in fact blamed her. So I asked her to collaborate with me and write letters and I carved envelopes and paired with them. There were other issues like uh, molestation and rape inside mosques and religious buildings. Uh, a lot of young kids who went there to study a uh, holy book and learn about religion were molested and not many people were talking about it. It was again considered another taboo subject. So I used that in my work. And uh, the, all five faucets actually represent five times of prayers uh, inside a mosque and the arches, which are actually often you see inside a mosque. A uh, few years ago, as you probably all know, uh, there was a driving ban on women in Saudi Arabia. So I have not been in just interested uh, about issues in Pakistan, but also in other countries as well, uh, especially other Muslim countries where there are extra restrictions and boundaries, especially on women. So when I was working on this series, I heard that uh, the ban was lifted at the, in 2018. So in this series, I carved rear view mirrors and painted eyes of beautiful women. As you know, Arab women make their eyes really pretty. It's often the only part of their body that they can show and they make their eyes really pretty. So a few years ago, they introduced a law which is called tempting eyes law, that if they make their eyes really pretty, they can be charged for that. And when I heard about it, I said, how ridiculous is that? So I decided to combine both in this work. So when the ban was lifted, in 2018, I decided to fly to Saudi Arabia and drive a car that a friend of mine, um, a friend, a woman activist, was actually arrested driving the very same car. Uh, can we please play this video? Okay. 2018, driving in Mecca. This is the very first year Women got permission to drive in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia mein, Makkah Mukarma mein, drive kare. Pehla saal hai, jab aurton ko ijazat mili hai drive karne ki. So, I mean, it was important for me, since a lot of women activists who fought for that rights were still behind bars, even though the ban was lifted. So I decided to go to Saudi Arabia and drive on their behalf. 
Um, th this is the work from the same series, which was on a billboard in LA last year. I have also been interested and inspired by movements, uh, hashtags and uh, protest signs which started movements, for example, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, especially during COVID. So this is one of the examples where I use that. The one you see in the back is actual uh, protest sign that I actually created out of cardboard. And the one in the front is carved out of pine wood. I have done few pieces in that series, and these four pieces are actually uh, on display at Bellevue Arts Museum right now. So my parents were refugees. They were born in India and moved to Pakistan at the time of partition, 1947. So I grew up hearing stories of migration. Uh, and I remember when I was growing up, I saw a lot of refugees around us. Um, until 2013, Pakistan was on top of the list for taking maximum number of refugees, mostly from Afghanistan, but there were some from other countries as well. So I saw them struggling, uh, trying to make their home again. And then when I moved to US in 2008, I remember after a few years, I started feeling like this was my home. But whenever I visited Pakistan, people here would ask me, oh, you are going back home. So it started a conversation in my mind, um, if, what's the concept of home? Is it a place you are born, or is it a place where you feel you belong? And that started this conversation in my mind, and I decided to create a series searching for home. So the first image that came to my mind was actually a barbed wire fence, because I grew up around an area which was owned by army, and we saw a lot of barbed wire fences around us, and this is what reminded me of restrictions and boundaries. So I decided to carve that in wood. I am actually known for doing crazy pieces, works in wood, uh, which are very detailed and on miniature scale. So I remember in the beginning, a lot of people thought I was crazy when I was thinking about carving a barbed wire fence. But after um, about a year and a half, I did First six months, I, I actually spent trying to convince my assistant, who sometimes helped me with big projects in Pakistan, that this is what I want to do. And he probably thought I was crazy and didn't pay attention to me. But uh, since I was very persistent, he uh, said, OK, he will help me. And I spent another year on experiments. So after about a year and a half, this is all I had, like you know, a few pieces of barbed wire fence. But I, at that time, I had resolved the issue. And I knew it was just a matter of time that I had to create a 30 feet long barbed wire fence. So if you see closely, each knot is made in two pieces. And each middle section is five inches and also made in two pieces. It's cut straight. And then it's steamed and pressed in a mold to get this curve. And then it's glued together. So under every knot, there is a, there is a joint. But audience will not, uh, is not able to see it, so they actually think it's one piece. And this is me assembling at Bellevue Arts Museum where it was displayed the very first time, uh, gluing each piece, uh, piece by piece. And this is how it is installed. Uh, this, was, uh, this show was, uh, is actually traveling to different museums, and here it was installed in Philadelphia at Center for Art and Wood. And if you see in the middle, there is an underwear hanging, which is also carved out of wood. So for me, yes, I like to do works which are very surprising and technically challenging, but it is not enough for me. I have to uh, have something which make people think. For example, uh, one of the biggest crimes of war is actually rape and molestation, and not many people are talking about it. So I decided to carve uh, an underwear, and there is a red stain on it, not just talking about rape and molestation, but also referring to menstrual cycle. And I had all these questions in my mind that what uh, refugees or people moving from one place to another, which are probably are running away to save their life, are doing to get by that time. And I had all these questions related to women issues. For example, if they have an infant, or they are breastfeeding, or if they are pregnant, what are they doing to get by that time? Because they had such limitation of what they can take with them. This is another installation. If you enter into the show, you actually are faced by this 30 feet long barbed wire fence. And uh, it's intentional that people have to go around it to enter into the show. So they kind of feel restricted by the space. And when you are inside the fence, you actually see other works, uh, including this series which in which I painted 
young girls in refugee camps between the ages of four and 11. So a lot of people ask me why that age, it's because at that age they are still innocent and whatever they are going through, you can actually see from their expressions. This is one of the reference photographs for that installation. It's from um, a, a school in Pakistan which was attacked by Taliban and there are bullet holes in the wall and if you see there are leftover items on the walls. So I use that to, um, for this installation as a reference image. And if you see, uh, these paintings are also hanging on the wall as if someone has left them abruptly and there are bullet holes around them and then there are some ants crawling around them as well. Uh, this is a portrait of Lojan, who is originally from Syria, and when this portrait was taken, she was in a camp in Jordan. And when I saw her photograph, she had a broken shoulder, but she had that strength on her face that no matter what, I'm going to get by that time. And it reminded me of a dandelion plant, which is very fragile but has strength too. Uh, this portrait is of Sana Gulab, who is originally from Afghanistan but in a camp in Pakistan. Again, Mona and Laiba, originally from Syria and Afghanistan, in camps in Pakistan and Jordan. This is another installation, uh, which is a huge installation. I have about over 250 bricks and um, over about 50 leftover items, mostly shoes, pacifiers, cell phones. This is often the scene you, uh, or photographs you see after a place has been attacked or after war a lot of broken houses, buildings, and leftover items. This is a reference photograph for this work. Um, it is again a mosque which has been attacked, and if you see, all you see is leftover shoes and some items of the wounded and killed. Uh, I thought you might like to see some of the details of the uh, pieces in that installation, all the details. And these are all the shoes, actual and carved ones in that installation. And this is how it is composed with bricks. So there was a time in my career after a few years, a lot of people started giving, saying that you are really good at making uh, a very hard looking material like wood into very soft and fluid like uh, object. Uh, so I said, hmm, okay, what else can I do differently? And I said, okay, I'm gonna go in completely reverse and make wood look even uh, stronger or hard like bricks and stone. So these actually bricks uh, are carved out of mahogany wood and then they are sandblasted. There is another installation in this series, it's called The Stains Are Forever. Uh, in 2014, a school in Pakistan was attacked by Taliban. It was an army school of young kids and over 140 kids were killed. And I remember at that time, uh, I had a young daughter and I, when I saw the images, I couldn't sleep for days. I saw images of young bodies in pools of blood and I just couldn't sleep. It disturbed me and affected me so much. And just after a day, I started looking at images because it was an army school, there was a war going on between army and Taliban, a Pakistan army attacked some of the Taliban majority areas and ended up in that attack, some of their get, kids got killed, so it was a revenge attack on Pakistan army that you killed our kids, we are going to kill your kids. So just after a day, Pakistan army announced, we are not scared of you and we are going to reopen that school and they started washing floors of that school, which were completely covered with blood. And when I started looking at those images, they, they were even louder to me at that time. And I felt they're trying to wash the stains from the floor of history or stains from the history, which they will probably never be able to remove. So I, that gave me, um, that inspired me, that whole event to create a work and pacifiers, I use pacifiers in my work not just to represent infants and young kids, but also innocents. And here they are stained and the butterflies are painted on a floor mob, uh, nine butterflies representing nine months of pregnancy and total 39 pacifiers, again representing 39 weeks of pregnancy to represent motherhood, a mother's point of view and her loss. And I remember in that incident, only, all the kids who were killed were boys because birth of a boy is celebrated more in Pakistan. So by killing boys, they were trying to hurt the families that much more. And only one girl was killed. 
and probably by mistake, it was her first day in school, call her Bibi. And when I saw her, the only photograph I saw of her was of her shoes. And at that time, my daughter was of similar age and she had similar shoes. So it kind of broke my heart in a way and I decided to carve her shoes instead and actually treat them or stain them uh, like a Kala Bibi's shoes. And I actually photographed my daughter on a swing and I drew a cactus garden around her because cactus garden is lush and green from distance and it looks really pretty, but when you get close, it has thorns and it looks painful and dangerous. So that's exactly what I felt, the world is beautiful and dangerous too. So no matter how safe of a world we try to give to our kids, it is still dangerous. And you know, schools in US are even attacked. And so even while I was living here, I kept thinking, no matter how much safe world we want to give to our kids, is it really that safe? So I painted here, I wanted to show you my process of miniature painting. If you see, I make my own pigments in seashells and uh, use pigments to make gouache, sorry, uh, in seashells. We make our own paper, we make our own paper, uh, colors, even brushes, and surface, which is called wasli, by ourselves. And if you see here, I'm adding tiny details dot by dot. So the brushes are that small, and this is how it's finished with all these details. And then it's placed on a swing, and the stained shoes are placed underneath it. In the same series, I have uh, an installation in which I carved luggage pieces uh, because to me, luggage represents journey and moving from one place to another. And I often had this question in my mind what they are trying to carry with them when you are moving from one place to another. So since I, at that time, felt I do not know what they are bringing with them, so I initially carved the pieces closed. And if you see, there is one backpack with stained shoes, again representing the pain and suffering of the journey, especially kids and women who are more vulnerable feel it more. But after conducting some interviews, and I've done a lot of research in US as well as in other countries, when I was asking this question, what did you bring with you when you moved? After a while, I realized it's no secret. All they were able to bring, often they only had a limitation of bring one bag, and what they brought is just some clothes and everyday items. Although almost everyone told me that they tried to bring one thing that reminded them or of either their family, culture, or home that they were leaving behind. So there is a photograph you can see here, and also a toy. So I also wanted to show you how I do my sculptures. I often go to secondhand shops a lot. Sometimes I will borrow uh, from friends or people who have an object that I feel I would be interested to carve, and then I stage it in my studio. So this is an important stage in my, uh, in my process where I have to do staging, and once I know what exactly I want to carve, that's when I start the process of carving. So, in this piece, you can see all, actually all the pieces come out and you can take out the clothes and put them back. So they are made individually, but then they are composed and placed in a way that it looks like one piece. So this is from staging to actually a finished piece. And if you see in the detail, there is a portrait of a young girl. Um, and I met her mother here in Seattle through Refugee Women Alliance when I was conducting interviews with different refugees who have moved into this region. And she told me she is originally from Zambia and she got married when she was just 14 years old. And the person she was married to already had a wife in US and he was a US diplomat. So he made a lot of promises to her family that he will let her get education and she was really interested in getting education and um, will provide for the family and all these promises. But right after she got married, there was a lot of domestic abuse. She had kids one after another. Um, in the first three years of uh, her marriage, she had three kids. And after that, because she was a strong woman and she was standing up for herself, the husband thought he would not be able to handle her. So he left her in Zambia, took the kids, took her passport, and brought them to US with him, leaving her behind. So at that time, she was a smart woman. She realized her passport was expiring. She got it renewed. She got US visa, came to US with the help of first wife, took the kids, moved from shelter to shelter for two years until she met Riva, who helped her get transitional housing, got her enrolled in high school. She's actually now a nurse, practicing nurse. So I really wanted to uh, bring her story into the work to 
say, you know, there are many positive stories, how people can become productive member of the society, and why is it important to support these programs? There is another recent series, um, a recent installation in the series. I actually made paintings uh, since I realized in past few years the issue is spreading to other countries, including Burma, China, and other places. There was already going on issue between Israel and Palestine. So I actually used reference photographs, some of them, and I painted them in the rear view mirrors just to uh, continue the conversation of current situation in the world about refugees. And as you know, probably at currently there is, uh, it's increasing even more after the Ukraine war, war, there are a lot many refugees who are moving to different countries. While I was working on this series, one day I found two letters written to me by my brother, which were sandwiched between two photographs. My brother, uh, my father took him to England for treatment when I was just 10 years old and he passed away. And before passing away, he wrote two letters to me. And I was very young at that time. and I did not know that I had those letters. So when I found them, I, it made me very emotional. So I decided to carve an envelope out of pine wood and pair it with him just to give tribute as if I felt I had a piece of him with me. When I posted about this work, I started getting letters from people who were following me, my friends, who started sharing letters as old as, as, old as 1905 to as recent as few years ago, uh, stories of separation, moving from one place to another, love letters, uh, hard stories, beautiful stories, and I felt there was a need to share these stories. So I actually ended up creating a whole series because to me it is important to share a story. And this is what I feel. I feel it is important that we share our experiences with other people. Your story will heal you and your story will heal somebody else. When you tell your story, you free yourself and give permission, other per people permission to acknowledge their own story. Thank you. Great. So, um, so why don't you pass me the clicker? Um, so, uh, we're, we we def decided to uh, divide this. Uh, oh, we're going to keep the images going. Yeah. Um, so uh, whoever is running the show here, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm just going to cycle back to a certain image. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to cycle back to certain images and uh, um, ask, uh, ask uh, some questions. Uh, questions that I have, and maybe some of you have, about the work. Uh, and boy, I, I'm never going to have time to ask all the questions I've got. But let's just start with uh, uh, the first one, and maybe the most uh, obvious, which is, you know, uh, sculptors work in all sorts of materials. Uh, 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 they work in uh, uh, clay. Uh, they work in uh, uh, metal. Uh, uh, they work in uh, mixed media. Um, so, what's behind? Uh, obviously, the material—you know—the things that you carve are things that aren't typically made out of wood. So, what's be? And, and you know, this is something that you decided on quite a few years ago, uh, because it's it's the only material I'm I'm familiar with in your in your terms of your sculpture. So, um, what's behind your decision to make all these unlikely ob objects out of? Uh, all, all these objects out of the unlikely material of wood. So when I went to art school, a lot of people started giving me warnings not to take sculpture as your major because it's physically challenging and there were other layers of uh, challenges while living in a Muslim society. I got so many warnings that I said, okay, I have to see what's so tough about it. And I took it as a challenge. That's how I started. When I was in sculpture department, I noticed there was... Not, there were not many sculptors, and especially no women, especially working in this medium of wood. And when I started traveling, I noticed this was a very male-dominated medium. And I was always interested in women issues. So I said, what better medium than a male-dominated medium to talk about women issues? So this is my main reason for taking up this material, but I fell in love with it, and I continue to be passionate about it. Yeah, because uh, um, I know that uh, years ago I did see a, a sh an amazing show of trompe leather satchels. 
that were all being hung from hooks. And they looked just like leather. They were all beat, beat up, and you could practically feel the texture of the leather just by looking at them. But they were all made out of ceramic. And so, you know, I would think that, uh, so, so for example, uh, and I think it would be maybe a bit easier to make some of these things out of ceramics than wood, which, you know, for somebody who's never done any carving at all, just strikes me as a real challenge. So why, why, why wood in particular? Yeah, for the same reason uh, that I explained earlier, to bring a woman's voice in this medium. Also, nobody was really working in this medium. They thought it's more like a medium of craft. Same was the impression about miniature painting as well, that they are mediums of craft. And I thought uh, Pakistan has a rich, even actually Asia has a rich culture of uh, wood carving and miniature painting, but they were more like mediums of craft and I thought I could do something new with them. And I remember in the beginning, a lot of people were surprised and they couldn't believe that I would pick up this as my main medium. And I, they kept telling me that you will always be a carver or a craft person rather than an artist. And I knew that I could do something new with it. And I spent first 15 years learning the technique, sitting with traditional carvers, mastering the material. So after 15 years, I felt so comfortable that I could do anything with the material. And in 2018, I got Art Innovator Award, and that was the time that I really felt that this is what I was working towards. Uh, so I just have to tell people uh, who are watching this that uh, I've been looking at Humera's uh, fingers because, uh, you know, if I was doing this, uh, my fingers would be a wreck after the first day in the studio, and your fingers seem pretty intact. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you must be very careful, or maybe you wear protection or whatever, chipping I, away at all that wood. I try to take care of myself. I do have many scars on my hands, uh, but I am um, proud of them. Mm -hmm. They represent my journey and my challenges. And I am a person who likes to use my hands to carve, to paint, uh, all hands on. I'm trained as a miniature painter and sculptor, so they're both mediums, although very different. They complement in my work because I have, I've got all my patients from my miniature painting techniques and training, and I use them to when I'm working or making a sculpture to go into that detail and work on the miniature scale. Um, uh, you know, small pieces, and I think they uh, work in my favor. So, okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the miniature painting, and you remember I already said a couple of things I was going to ask her about, but we were talking about it before we started, and uh, in, in her materials list here, she says that these are done in uh, gouache pigments on handmade Wasley paper. And so I'd never heard of Wasley paper, and so I looked it up on the internet, I figured, okay, well, let's just order some on Amazon, and I'll see what it's like. Well, it turns out that there is no such thing as ordering this paper on the internet, and in fact, as you were saying, all these materials are, are you, you, were, you, you, you were trained to make all these materials by hand, right? The paint, the paper, and uh, even the paintbrushes. So That's talk, correct. So talk a little bit about that. So uh, we get all our basics as if uh, it was the Mughal time or Persian time. And we learn to make our own brushes from squirrels here. And we learn to make our own gouache using pigments and other colors. We also learn to make this paper, which is actually layers of paper glued together and burnish it down. So it's very strong paper since in miniature painting, we do layers and layers of rendering and paint. So it has to be strong to hold that uh, all the layers and uh, multi-layer of treatment. So yes, we do learn all the basics, but then in our school, once they teach you all the basics, they push you to find your own style or subject matter and push the boundaries of medium. Um, and uh, um, this one is, is and, and the scale has changed, obviously. I mean, it was called miniature painting, but this one no longer qualifies as miniature. It's like uh, 72 inches. Well, we saw it. it it's as big as, the, uh, as big as the seat of a swing. So I, I want to talk to you about something else. I guess this is a, a picture we could look at, or maybe we'll go look at another one, uh, which is that, um, 
Yeah, so you know, uh, there's so much pain uh, that you reference in these, in these pictures. And um, um, I was saying that I know very little, and I think Americans in general know very little about the history of the Asian subcontinent. And I know that there was this, that there was a, a, what we now euphemistically call a, a mass casualty event um, at the time of partition, which mm -hmm. I know is still very, I, I'm sure it's, it's still a living part of the history. And so I'm wondering, uh, and I think you've already referred to it, but you must have grown up with a sense of the world being a dangerous place just based on the stories you heard and your parents' experience and the fact that the history wasn't that long ago, really. We're talking about the you know, late 1940s and so on. That's correct. Uh, we grew up hearing stories of migration and often they were painful stories, uh, stories of uh, often losing a family member or a close person or witnessing a murder in front of them or displacement and leaving everything behind and moving. Um, I mean, that migration is still the biggest migration in the history, 1947 between Pakistan and India. So yes, there were many painful stories. And when I was growing up, I saw, I witnessed a lot of refugees trying to make their home again in Pakistan. And I saw their suffering and their loss and their pain. So yes, I grew up hearing and witnessing all these stories. And when I moved to US, although that was out of choice, but I could relate to a few things, like you know, the concept of home and missing, uh, you know, few things that I left behind. So it's true. But then in my work, I often feel when I something is bothering me as much, I need to talk about it. Uh, I grew up not talking about so many issues that for me it was not an option anymore, because I realized not talking is not resolving any issue. So I decided to open all these conversations and difficult topics in my work. Yeah, and so I've got a question for you. I really have no idea what your answer is going to be because, I, I mean, as you know, Americans do have a sort of a stereotypical view of uh, Pakistan as a place, you know, Osama bin Laden lived there, and typically we hear about, it, we hear about instability or terrorism or, 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 or whatever, but also we hear about it as being a very conservative society. Um, uh, so I'm wondering, um, your work is very provocative, and even for an American audience, I think it's a little shocking, you know, the underwear and the stains and the ants, you know, and so on. So is there work that we've seen tonight or other work that you've done that would be too um, uh, controversial to show in Pakistan, that you would be reluctant to show in Pakistan? So I have traveled to many parts of the world including Africa, Europe, Asia, US, America, and other countries as well. And there is one thing I felt, all the issues are same. It's just the difference of scale. So probably the scale is bigger in Pakistan for certain issues, but all the issues are same everywhere. I, whenever I show this work here, I hear stories, similar stories, even here as well. And I mean, of course, I've taken this work to Pakistan as well, and I have been sh trying to show um, and keep my roots in Pakistan as well. And everywhere people have similar response. They, it, my work might be difficult for some groups. Yes, it's true in Pakistan. But as an artist, I feel it's a responsibility to educate society and open all these taboos and normalize situations. So I think as an artist, I feel that responsibility and do not really care about the effect. I mean, my sister lives in UAE, and I remember when I started doing Tempting Eye series, she gave me a warning, and she said, you will get in trouble, uh, because a lot of regions do not like their issues raised, um, and uh, they go out of their way to uh, you know, try to stop it. And I remember I told her, I don't care. I mean, I heard similar stories. My teacher was beaten up in his house for painting nudes in Pakistan. I know all these stories. Do you think it's going to stop me? It will not stop me. But have you ever felt, have, 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 have you ever experienced any kind of censorship uh, here, there, no. or anywhere where people said, we can't show this in Lahore because people will get upset and they'll pick at the gallery, whatever? No, I don't think so. And I never felt that because private galleries are pretty open. Okay. And they are open to challenging works and talking about stereotypes and all these taboos. 
So I have been lucky that I had worked with galleries which were very supporting, and I think art community is pretty open-minded. And so a lot of people who have trouble do not really come to art shows anyway. So if I, w I mean, if I, I have done public projects as well. So for public projects, you have to be careful about things. But I'm doing public projects in US too, and I've noticed there, are, there is some limitation here as well. There are things you cannot do even here as well. Oh, 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 so. tell me about it. Uh, I lived in the middle of Manhattan, and the show was censored um, in a, um, a, a, in a, there was an office building, had a lobby with spectacularly well curated uh, shows uh, for the enjoyment of the tenants. And they had a show on the nude, and there was full frontal male nudity, and it was censored. Yep. It was up for a couple of days, and then it was removed because some of the tenants objected. You know, yep. the penis was just a bridge too far. So you know, even in this country, yeah, we're we're much more puritanical about certain things than we think. We're not we're not totally liberal. Yeah, I mean, so that's why I say it's only the difference of scale. All the issues are similar everywhere in the world. Um, okay, well, I'm just looking at my, my question list and looking at the time. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, l let's see what I have time for. So what about um, the, the ants? Because um, that's uh, pretty ubiquitous in your work. And I think there's ants in this one, right? That's uh, correct. Yeah, so um, what's the, uh, you talked about the symbolism of the moths on, or the, the butterflies on the broom and, you know, the number of pacifiers and, you know, the, that, that's a weeks of pregnancy and so forth. But the ants appear quite a bit. So what do the ants mean to you? Well, why, why are we seeing them? So I use a lot of symbols in my work. And I, ants I use as a symbol as well. I grew up seeing ants around us whenever we left something. Anything that was left behind, dead or decaying, you would see ants crawling around them. So there is that element af uh, affiliated with them. And also, when I was doing series of migration, ants are known for migrating in groups, and they have a female leader. They are very hardworking. So all of that that I could relate with, and I thought it's very relevant to my series. But one of the most important reasons I use ants in my work, and they are, by the way, they are made out of wire, epoxy, putty, and paint. So each one is handmade. And it took me a year and a half to uh, figure out the technique. So, they, for me, a lot of people like you ask me why there are ants. When I have a show, for example, I have carved a very nice tea uh, ceremony tray. And um, if I feel if there are very nicely carved pieces, people would come say, yeah, it's very nice. But when there is a presence of ants, it makes them think. And it makes them a little uncomfortable. And it starts a conversation why there are ants. And it almost always happens that people come and ask me why there are ants or they have this conversation between them if they are in groups uh, about the presence of ants. And one of the most important things in my work is to start a conversation, make people think. So this is one of the reasons I use them in my work as well. So, you uh, so what you're saying is that, uh, because you know, I've had, a, I've had a number of shows myself, but I find that certain work People just come up and they say, okay, that's interesting. Certain work brings out stories. And so it sounds to me that what your experience is that you have these shows and people come up and they tell you their stories. Is that true? That's correct. So often people come and they start sharing their stories with me. I remember I had multiple miscarriages many years ago. And at that time, I uh, was in that you know, the sense of state where I was looking for answers and somebody to talk to. And whenever I tried to talk to someone, even some of my friends who have had miscarriages would not be open to it, and they didn't want to talk about it. So, I mean, the reason I started this work is to start all these conversations and open all, uh, and make people share their stories. So when I, I ended up making this whole series about fertility issues and motherhood, and miscarriages, and I remember many people, many women came to me, some of them started crying and started sharing their stories, which I was otherwise not able to do. So I think art has that power to, bring, to make people open up and give them courage. And I all truly believe when you share your story, it, makes, it gives people courage to share their story as well. 
So I guess I don't remember. What were you using to symbolize uh, miscarriages? Because I don't think it's a theme of any of the pieces in this particular series. Is that true? That's true. It was uh, almost actually 10 years ago. Okay. And uh, I used the color red along with my wood carvings and all the symbols of miscarriages using pacifiers and faucets uh, with leaking blood and all the symbolism. But yes, I use the color red, which not just, which also has duality, multi many meanings depending on the region. It's a color of wedding dress in Asia, but it's the color of mourning and death in Africa. And it represents love, but it also represents loss. So uh, th this is something which is interesting to me when a symbolism or an object has multi layers of messaging than I use in my work. So, yeah, I guess as we go through your work, I think the one thing that it has in common is that it's all provocative. So, in other words, you know, you have this, um, you, you have this spectacular uh, uh, ability to, you know, as you say, you know, make wood. Uh, you know, bring anything to life in in in, in terms of wood, um, and yet it, it it's always um, towards an end. It's all provocative. You know, it all has this duality because it's on the one hand it's beautiful craft, and on the other hand, every piece we've seen brings up a difficult or a painful or uh, you know or sort of a hidden issue. Um, and so, and, and I, so you, you never just do pieces that are, you know, beautiful to look at. There's always this other aspect to them. It's true. Making something just beautiful or aesthetically appealing is not enough for me. I have to have uh, a reason or a message behind it. And, uh, and since I'm passionate about taboos and stereotypes and women issues, social issues, so this is uh, usually the concept behind my work. Yeah, and and that's really because um, I know that uh, 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 you know at times just because of the material you work in, uh, and ceramic artists have this happen too. I know um, sometimes you get lumped in as a craft artist, right? But but uh, craft artists don't typically deal with miscarriage and you know rape and the uh, refugee crisis and so forth i mean have you been in craft shows uh, um you know where other people were doing works that were just sort of well well carved but didn't necessarily have a message so uh, for me a successful work of art is where concept and execution are in balance so both get the importance not just only one over the other so having this balance is important for me. And regarding the shows with the group that I participate, that I'm a little conscious of that whenever I have an opportunity, it is important to know who else is showing with me. Mm -hmm. And if it all connects, connects together and it, if it, have, it has similar story or you know, uh, a reason to be together. Okay, so there have been times when you were going to be included in a show just as a wood carver, yeah. and it wasn't necessarily with other work that you felt was compatible with what you did. I actually don't think I'm a wood carver. I just am an artist. <laughs> I don't want any label. Uh, yes, my, some of my mediums are more prominent than others, but I have also done video. I've also worked in metal. I have also... Um, done different styles of painting, and I do public projects in different materials as well. But yes, my work is often in wood for s certain reasons. It is also a reason that wood has this living quality, skin-like colors, and uh, also because it's a male-dominated medium. But I don't think I want to have any label. I'm just an artist, and I'm happy to show, regardless of a craft museum or a fine art museum, uh, wherever I can convey my message. Um, so is this one of the more recent pieces in the slideshow? So you say in progress, does this mean it's, it's come in, in your studio now or just about to, uh, or, or just recently left your studio? Yes, yeah, so it was installed at Bellevue Arts Museum uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's up until end of this year. I have done more pieces in that series, so when I will do my studio tour next week, I will show you two new pieces that I'm doing for my upcoming solo show at Greg Cusera Gallery. 
Um, so yes, it is a se recent series, but I'm also working on some other uh, works as well. And okay, so now I have to say, I'm looking at this one, and uh, I know that one of these is made is cardboard as the model, and the other one is wood. But I'm looking, at, I'm looking, at, I'm not positive which one is which. I actually am proud of uh, my techniques and my details. And uh, a lot of people tell me about many of my pieces, especially when I did barbed wire fence. People would come really, really close and try to see where the joint is, if they can see if it's really wood or it's actually metal. Um, and I take pride in that. Uh, that's all I can say. Then. Oh, no, okay. Well, <laughs> I like to surprise my audience. Yeah, okay, well, so um, you all can uh, uh, you all can uh, uh, you all can vote on the chat bot and tell us which is the uh, well the real cardboard. Uh, please stand up. So, um, uh, how did this happen? Is this was this a public art um, opportunity in Los Angeles? That's correct. Uh, there is a group called uh, the Creative Billboard. And especially during COVID, they decided, since nobody was going to museums and galleries anymore at that time, they decided to put the art in public so people have access to it. And this was a project during COVID, and I was part of it. One of my pieces, this one, actually was selected to be on a billboard in LA near the Hollywood Boulevard. And since it not just represents a huge issue, uh, which is mostly in Saudi Arabia and Arab countries, but also the bruise around her eyes represents domestic abuse, which is hidden, and which actually increased, that issue increased during COVID. So it talked about multi layers of social issues. So I really, really felt very, um, I, I actually felt it was appropriate for this project. Oh, you know, I'm. I, it, it, that's that's what's good about seeing some of these images twice. Is I did actually not notice the bruise. Yeah, I I was just noticing the scale in L.A. and the billboard. Okay, yeah. So that's very provocative. I would hope that most people would notice that as they were driving by or whatever. Yeah, because that makes the image even more uh, interesting. So what did you learn? Uh oh, maybe we missed it. Oh, where was the, where was the, oh, this is the one. Yeah, we're not gonna see the video again, but what did you learn? This is the one that has the video embedded in it where you, you actually went to Saudi Arabia and you went driving around. What did you learn from your experience driving in Saudi Arabia? I'm curious. So although the ban was lifted, it was the very first year the ban was lifted, I did not see a woman driver at that time. Oh. Uh, during the time I was there, uh, it was still considered difficult, although uh, permission was given. Uh, but I, there was something inside of me that told me to do it. And I really wanted to go and uh, drive on behalf of my sister activists who were still behind bars and could not practice that right which, for which they fought for years. Uh, it did, did it feel dangerous? It was uncomfortable. Uh, my friend arranged the car for me. Uh, now she lives in US. She was arrested back in Saudi Arabia at that time and it was the very same car. And she had someone bring the car to me, uh, which was in Mecca. Um, and I had to, I was, I, the way I wanted to drive and he refused to sit with me in the car because he was scared, although the permission was given. And my husband was with me who was actually uh, documenting me and he was uncomfortable and he also felt there were some people who were following us. But I didn't care. This was something I wanted to do and I just did and I feel really good about that. But people gave you funny looks as you're driving around? Uh, yeah, probably, I just didn't care. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm a guy living in America and it's like, the, I'm, I'm never gonna have to deal with something like that, but yeah. I don't think I would be quite brave enough to do that. Maybe I've heard so much about Saudi Arabia and, uh, you know, I mean, we do tend to hear the more extreme things from these yeah. countries, right? Not, not about normal life and so on. It's true, and it's same, the same is the case with Pakistan and many other countries. People have stereotypes. They think, I remember uh, in 2004, it was um, the first few years of my career, and I went for an international residency in Malaysia, and they were artists from different countries, and one of the questions some people asked me was, are we are really surprised to see a woman 
and I was the only one working among other sculptors in, uh, in the medium of wood. And they said, we thought women in Pakistan are locked in houses yeah. and men are with guns on their shoulder. Well, <laughs> and yeah. I said, no. Oh, and this was in Malaysia. Yes. Oh, boy, it's not, they should know better. I mean, it's yeah. like uh, people have stereotypes. Oh, that's interesting. Whoa. But, <laughs> but I mean, the they were extreme. artists from different countries. Yeah. They probably, what they, their information was through media. Yeah. And you know, media only projects certain images and, you know, stereotypes usually. Whereas I was living in Lahore most of my life when I was in Pakistan. And it's a big city. It's uh, where you get freedom to do whatever you want. Yes, there are probably smaller towns and areas where probably people are more conservative and doing things might be challenging. But I did not feel that. And I was also... I am from a family who is comparatively open-minded, so I got all the freedom to do whatever I wanted. Yeah, well, you know, we were talking about how there's not a big tourist industry in Pakistan, and partly because of its reputation, but uh, I encourage everybody uh, to just, you know, just Google Lahore, and you will be amazed by the spectacular Mughal architecture, which has survived all the turmoil and the partition and blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, there's uh, amazing, amazing structures there. Uh, and you can see why it would be a, a, an interesting place to visit as a tourist. Okay, so um, we have uh, ended part two of our program, uh, where I got to ask Himara some of my uh, uh, burning questions. So. Um, now it's uh, your turn. Um, good, and we've got the, so what I will do uh, um, is I'm going to read the questions, and uh, these are all coming off, off our, um, uh, we got a monitor in front of us here so we can see them here. Oh, great. Oh, we've got some very cool questions. So, uh, oh, I love all these questions. Okay, let's start with number one. How big are the wood pieces, life-size or smaller? So often, a lot of my pieces are life-size. Uh, I like the one piece I showed you, open suitcase, which is an actual size, and the carved one is exactly the same size. And my reason are also because I think of myself a storyteller. And I think when you have a life-size object, it's, it's easier to relate to it and uh, open up and share a story. So yes, mo often my work is life-size, but there have been times when my work was oversized or smaller than life-size as well. Okay. Oh, I love this next question. Um, obviously, we've got some uh, potential wood uh, artists in the uh, audience here. Um, and there's something I don't have a clue about. Maybe that's why I like it so much. What are your favorite and your most favorite and least favorite types of wood to work with? Uh, initially, I worked mostly in mahogany. Uh, when I took the challenge uh, of sculpting and also working in wood, and I got all these warnings, and I said, okay, I'm going to take sculpture as my challenge, and I started working in wood. For me, at that time, it was important to extend my challenge, and I picked the most um, hardest wood available in Pakistan, which was mahogany at that time. So I started working in mahogany, and I've done my early, in my early career, a lot of work in mahogany. And after I overcame that challenge, it was not a challenge for me anymore, and I started thinking, what are the most suitable words for my concepts and ideas? The most suitable? Yeah, most suitable to my idea. Okay. So this is the, what I feel right now. Whenever I have an idea at that time, I decide what will be the most suitable word for that, special, uh, that specific idea and piece. And I use, yes, pine a lot recently because it's a word that has a skin-like color, so it reminds you of humans. But also I can bleach or stain it. Um, I cannot bleach mahogany wood since it's so dark. It just keeps on bleeding. So there are different reasons I select different woods. I've also worked in uh, some woods like ebony, uh, wengi, some African European lace wood. So I have worked in different woods, and uh, now when I select wood for certain piece, it's usually a reason behind it, conceptual reason. Okay, but so most of them are exotic, right? Not so much from the from 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 not so much from around here. 
uh, there are some local words I've used here as well, but mm. I still buy a lot of my word in Pakistan since I still have a studio in Pakistan. So I spend some time of the year in Pakistan and mm. that's often when I buy my material and start the piece and then I ship it here and finish it here. And do you ever have like environmental issues with certain types of wood because it's endangered or because of questions about how it's harvested and so forth? No, I often used uh, the, the wood that I buy from Pakistan is either mahogany or pine most of the time. And they are usually harvested for the purpose of furniture making or construction. So that is not an issue. But when I have to ship it to US, I do have to go through a process of fumigation and all of that to make it safe to ship. So uh, I'm, I have gotten used to it now. And, and mahogany grows in Pakistan? It's yes. a local wood? Yeah. Okay. What's mahogany maho and pine. What's a mahogany tree look like? Are they big, small? <laughs> yes. Would I know one if I saw one? They're often big. Yeah. yeah. Somehow I think it must be a beautiful tree because it's, it's such a beautiful wood. It is. I love mahogany and I love pine wood. They are two of my favorite woods. But then there are certain reasons I've used ebony and wengi wood and lace wood. And there are different reasons why I like those woods as well. Uh, would you ever like to carve an ivory? I know it's not really possible. Sometimes there's ivory that you know comes from a, a piano that's been recycled or whatever. I have not carved ivory yet, but I did carve old um, cow's bone okay. uh, that I bought somewhere where they were selling a very old piece. And I carved and I actually carved pacifiers out of it. So I um, have, yes, I have carved uh, just bone in general, bone, not ivory. Yeah. You made pacifiers out of cow bones. Yes. That seems very appropriate somehow, <laughs> yeah. right? It does. Yeah, yes. the connection with the milk. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know True. you like that sort of double meaning or whatever. Okay, next question. Oh, this is another terrific question. Congratulations, folks. These are really good questions. What makes wood feminine for you? I actually do not think any medium or material is feminine or masculine. I think it's the subject matter. I think it's the way you present it, you uh, work in it. Uh, that's what makes it feminine or masculine. Yeah, although I guess what they're, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe I might have asked the same question, just because there's something about, you know, we think about, uh, I, I know maybe this is too much of, uh, uh, too much gender stereotyping, but you think about, uh, you know, metal, uh, uh, you think about welding uh, 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 and, uh, you know, metal work as uh, metal as being a more masculine material, whereas there's something about wood, the way it's, yield, it, it's yielding, it has these beautiful sensual sur surfaces and so forth. I guess that's probably where that question came from. Uh, it might be true, but in my opinion, when I look at a work, uh, there are certain symbolism and reasons that I can tell it's done by a male artist or female artist. And uh, sometimes it's a subject matter, sometimes it's the treatment. But in wood, I actually think I can uh, often tell, not always I'm saying, I'm not claiming that, but often I can tell if it's done by male sculptor or a female. Because of the subject matter, the sensitivity, the treatment, there is a difference. And I actually think it, uh, actually one of my wishes is to have a show with a male artist who works in word to have a male and female point of view next to each other so people can actually see and experience that. So in a different way, they both are very interesting, but there are clearly differences, uh, the way the material is handled, the subject matter that's presented. Uh, okay, and uh, I think this might be our last question. And then we can just, we can uh, wind up. I have a thing or two to ask you at the very end. What is your relationship with your family now after defying their wishes? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's a really good question. And it's a very good question to end this conversation. I went to art school against the wishes of my family. And after a few years, I was able to establish myself. Uh, right after I finished my school, I was called back as a faculty member. Uh, and at that time, the school had a rule that you have to have at least two years of experience, but they really wanted to have me teach right away. So because of which, I ended up becoming the youngest assistant professor in the history of art school. 
and I was able to establish myself. I was showing my work. I had my solo show three years after I graduated, which was very successful. So I was not just practicing. I had an established studio, teaching, and uh, being recognized that very quickly my family came around. And uh, I remember there was a day when my father said in front of the whole family that it was the right decision, and he's proud of me. It's one of the best moments of my life. And both my brothers, who were against me to go to art school, both their sons went to art school. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. So you got one some... just graduated and one is enrolled recently. So you can see how things changed pretty quickly. Um, okay. So, um, so, that's, so we have uh, got some. I really love those questions. Thank you. For, for all those, very, very provocative. Okay, so I just, I just did want to mention one other thing, is that we only saw some of Humara's work, and uh, as I recall, you've done some kinetic sculptures too, right? Things that move with gears and so forth? I do, um, and often my reason is conceptual. If I'm doing, uh, making some work, for example, a tricycle in wood, it actually runs. If it's a scissors, you can cut something with it. So they actually kind of work also, just like an actual object. I don't have to do it, but I don't know why I do it. Maybe I'm obsessive, I'm a little crazy, but this is something I love. Uh, I love details. I love working on my pieces, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. Uh, same piece, but um, this is something that excites me. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite of uh, of an abstract expressionist <laughs> who comes to a studio and goes, wow, wow, bang, <laughs> next painting. It's like exactly it's meditative, and it's slow, and it's careful, and we'll see some of it on our studio tour. Okay, last question is, um, if people want to see some of your work in person, uh, what are their opportunities in this area? So I am represented by Greg Cusera Gallery um, in downtown Seattle. Uh, you can see my work there. I have currently some of my work up at Pelvi Arts Museum. Uh, I have, uh, I'm recently in a show at Seattle Art Museum, uh, Seattle Asian Art Museum uh, in a show, Embodied Change. You can see my work there. I have an installation at Seattle Municipal Tower next to their entrance, a permanent installation. You can see my work there. And there are other places, City of Bellevue, City of Seattle, King County, they have my work in permanent collection, as well as City of Tacoma, Portland, so. Okay, great. Well, um, lots of opportunities, and uh, I'm sure there will be more in years to come. So uh, thank you. Himara, thanks Town Hall, and thanks all of you for, for, uh, for joining us. And uh, that will conclude our program. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.